models, uh, built in any logic in particular, but, but agent based models more generally, um, have, in addition to tapping into big data sources of various types, high velocity, um, high volume, variety, and high veracity data, they further um, are increasingly tied in with geographic databases. You can view this as a type of big data, and I wouldn't disagree with you. Um, uh, but uh, within this context, um, models are informed by uh, data from the world um, on geographical quantities. And, um, and it's worth being aware that when it comes to the interface of, of, of dynamic models with geographic data, as with models with other sorts of data, there's a number of structured ways in which models can relate to that data. And there's a number of ways where models relate to geographic data that have a pretty good texture because we're dealing with geographic data. So I, I want to enumerate some of these ways because it may get you thinking about ways that models might interface with your, with, with data you have in hand or your models might interface with data you know of. Um, so one common feature is we have a model and um, agents are affected by, by resources and particularly by distance of resources to them. And I think to, to explicate this back, best, I would like to open up a model that we all had opened up on the very first day. And if you go to any logic and you do recently opened models, you should find one um, uh, that, is, um, that was built earlier. Okay, now it looks like it is far enough back. I don't actually have it uh, directly handy here. Uh, in my recently used model. So I will go and uh, open it up uh, to see if it's in my, um, in my downloads here, okay? Um, and we will um, uh, we'll see if we can uh, load it in from that. Otherwise, we'll load it down from uh, the site, okay? Um, uh, it is called GIS Food and PA Environment. Um, and if you want to look on the site, if, if you don't have that handy, um, I would just note that um, uh, in the participant resources under example models, under the AnyLogic 8 examples, there's a whole swack of models, but this one is further within the hybrid models area, okay? Um, so it's in hybrid model um, here, okay? And uh, it's GIS, um, uh, the GIS food environment, um, food and PA environment. Um, and, oh, okay. Um, this is a, a related one with adding supermarkets. That would do for this purpose. It looks like there's another one. Uh, yeah, here, here it is. Um, in, with not in the, um, the hybrid models area, which is kind of strange. Okay. In any case, um, these models are good. There's a set of other models in GIS model area that uh, might also be interesting, okay? Now, I wanna illustrate some of these principles by reference to some of these models. So, um, a model that uses the distance of resources. Let's go see where this is used, okay? So, in this model, if we go into person, we'll find that when they're deciding what sort of uh, food they want to buy, um, there's this probability of shopping wisely, okay? And where did I find that? I went to here, this, this little transition that determines they're going to the supermarket, um, otherwise they're going to the convenience store. And in any logic, this is a default transition. This is one that happens if the others don't. It's kind of the leftover, the else transition. So if this doesn't happen, this will, okay? This transition is associated with a condition. If it, 
it, with random true, this is a certain probability, okay, um, that it's given, probability here. And random true will flip a coin with that probability. The probability here is given by prob of shopping wisely. So I'm going to click on that. Prob of shopping wisely. And you'll notice that this makes use of this distance to function. So we're actually asking, what's the nearest agent among the convenience stores? What's the nearest agent amongst the, um, uh, amongst the supermarkets? And, and for each of those, if we have the, the nearest convenience store, we find out it's its distance. If we have the supermarket, we find out its distance. So this is an example here of, of determining distances to resources. Okay? We're finding the distance from a convenience store versus the distance to a grocery store, the nearest one in both cases, to determine where they go. One example of, um, of use of this. Uh, there's, other, there's other similar examples. Um, where we might find the closest clinic and go to the closest clinic um, to us uh, involving care seeking. But um, in any case, here we have geographic information that determines this, the distance and that shapes agent decision making. That's operating here within this model. Another way that this model is influenced has to do with the second one, routing agents along particular paths. So if we run this model, you may remember it from earlier, but if we run this, we place agents here in a geographic environment, right? This is Melbourne. And if you have your mice today, you could zoom in on this with your middle button, okay? Oh, oh, yeah, okay, I zoomed in a bit too far here. But basically you can, you can zoom in and out by using your mouse button. I'm trying to do it on my trackpad and it is um, not terribly well controlled, uh, as you can see. I'm, I'm somewhere um, varying between thousands of miles of altitude and, uh, and you know, uh, uh, just, just a mile or something. Um, so I'm gonna go back and run this again. If you have your mouse button, you can hold down the control button, I think it is, click on the mouse, hold down the control button, and then you can zoom in and out with that mouse wheel, okay? Holding on the control button and, and using the wheel. Um, here though, if you may remember, and I'll zoom in just so you can see it, zoom in on the map this way, another way of, of zooming in on the model as a whole, um, and I'll sort of bring the, the map uh, around here. But when agents are moving, um, you may notice that they move along streets, okay? They're actually um, traveling along thoroughfares here in, in uh, Melbourne. So um, they actually move along these various avenues. And we'll see if we could see one. But it, it becomes very clear um, if you're patient at uh, uh, finer resolutions like this. Now this movement along streets, here we go. Yeah, you could, you could see them kind of going between different, different streets. They seem to be placed by their head. Um, um, and uh, yeah, see this, this one just took the, the various uh, street to that favorite convenience store. The, the Tim Tams must be particularly good there. Um, and uh, here if we go look at person, we'll find that, um, uh, that their head is indeed at the center. So that's where kind of their official location is, okay? Um, uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, they're being routed along streets. Now in this case, it's a bit of overkill. But the distance calculation is done variously, either straight line distance or according to particular modes of transportation and the thoroughfares for that, okay? So we can, if we go to Maine, for example, here, um, we can look at routing and we can say, for example, route this according to foot or route this according to bike or to car, okay? Um, and uh, you can ask for the distance, and I think that distance too uses the preferred 
mode of transportation. So you'll be asking for foot distance, how far is this? Versus if you needed to take a bike or you needed to take a, um, a vehicle um, or rail transport, um, how, would you, how would you do it? So in short, we can have agents whose distance calculations are determined based on how far they have to go along the street network and whose, um, whose actual movement is defined by that. Now, you may wonder, why would we do that? Well, one reason that we have found in our big data work is that often there is a material difference between the activity space of a person and what you deduce by actually considering by their movement patterns, day in, day out, their actual mobility patterns, versus simply their home location. So by their home location, we may say, you know, this person is in, is in a highly advantaged environment when it comes to physical activity. But when we look at actually where they work, where they spend their time, where they drop their kids off at school, um, where, they, where they spend most of their day, you may actually find that it is um, in a, a less advantaged area. It's you know, an area with poor physical infrastructure for physical activity. Or if you're interested in some of our work, as some of our work is, on the effects of tobacco messaging on the person um, and their propensity of using, um, using cigarettes, reflecting the fact that, say, in the States, there are still advertisements in some areas of the country on, on billboards for tobacco, for example. Someone's path that they take day in, day out may bring them into close proximity with some of these advertisements or some of these promotional things or bring them by a store which you know, promotes or a gas station that promotes cigarettes um, in its vicinity. So the point is particular paths are sometimes of use a further and final one I'll just note here is um, exposure to not, not messaging or food environment or, or built environment for physical activity, but for particulate matter and in, 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 um, um, in air quality, right? If you're going along certain thoroughfares, Wiltshire Avenue, for example, in an LA area, or you're making your way along um, uh, certain um, highly trafficked routes in a larger city like Mexico City, there may be pollution levels that are, are significant along that. And we can capture that by reducing about the routes of travel. Now, it bears noting that this sort of routing that we see here, um, that we saw here, um, uh, this sort of routing is, uh, is something which takes a fair bit of computational, in fact, communicational um, uh, effort. Um, and, and so it actually takes a lot to plan these routes, okay? And it will slow the model down a lot um, to, for, for it to have to reason about the particular thoroughfares, especially if they're engaged in different routes on different days. If they're just using the same route again and again, it, it, it doesn't add that much. But if they're using different routes day to day, it could add a lot of work. So if your model doesn't need this, in general, you, you don't use it. You have them hop. You have them hop from home to work, or you have them hop from home to daycare to work, or whatever. Um, so the point is, um, this is one way that, that um, uh, the geographic information can, can influence agents, but it's not the only way. Another way is we associate agents explicitly with resources. So maybe we have agents who, for example, um, go to shelters around the city. And the agent is, uh, has a shelter with which they are associated or some social housing. And um, that's their home. And that home is a geographic location which keeps them in a certain place. Here we. We actually have geographic information for parks. They're out there in Pierpool Place. Um, uh, we add it for supermarkets, we add it for convenience stores. But the houses are scattered in the city. And this is yet another way. If you want to see this in the model, I would just refer you 
to um, the, the uh, population of homes. So if we were to go into Maine, uh, go down Maine, and we were to go look, for example, at um, the population of homes here, um, I'll have to scroll down a little bit here, but uh, homes here. You'll notice I ask, find a random point inside the city of Melbourne, okay? And that's where homes are placed. By contrast, the various um, supermarkets, convenience stores um, are placed at empirically known locations as derived from GIS databases. So um, what I'm trying to say here is that um, the, uh, sometimes we associate agents with resources that are located in space and we, we use that to give the agent a home which exposes them to local crime levels or local particulate matter, et cetera. Um, another reason we may use GIS information is to to have geographic specific information on exposure level, on, on particulate matter levels or contamination levels, you know, super fun site uh, locations, um, levels of, um, of nitrous oxides or, um, or sulfur dioxides um, for, for adverse air quality or, or PP, you know, the, um, the small particulate matter um, uh, type of information. So here we might use information in a GIS database that's temporal in nature in the model to capture the exposure levels of these agents moving through. And you might look at counterfactual situations involving um, transit patterns or what have you and ask how would they change the health outcomes because the exposure levels are different or how would they change the average exposure level for agents or or the, um, the equity of those exposure levels across the population. Um, it turns out that um, in a feature that Ross Hammond has used in one of his demonstration models involving spread of infectious disease in St. Louis, um, he doesn't make use of technically a GIS database, but he has a kind of visual setup that suggests that. Um, but basically here we capture GIS data to reflect the fact there's limitations in agent movement. So agents can only cross the river at certain locations, and that brings agents into contact with each other at much higher levels than they would otherwise, okay? Um, and this is of great importance in things like uh, disaster, um, uh, disaster related uh, modeling modeling concerning, say, evacuations following a terrorist attack, et cetera, um, or following a, you know, a, a, an, an accident with toxic chemicals, um, uh, or following uh, fear-based fear um, uh, responses to an outbreak, where basically people's movement uh, patterns are constrained by the geography and that ends up affecting epidemiological outcomes by inducing waiting queues or uh, traffic jams or what have you, um, problems in evacuation. Um, uh, we, we also have some models where people are driven by observed mobility patterns and, um, and those mobility patterns are used to drive the agents in ways that then perhaps expose them to risk of illness, either through um, environmental exposures or infectious disease exposure, pathogen transmission, et cetera. Um, there are cases uh, like Paul's uh, CWD model where the simulation endogenously augments GIS situated data. So the idea here is deer drop prions where they are. And the deer's patterns of toing and froing, wandering hither and yon, is reflected in the buildup of prions. And prions may build up in certain paths or certain sites more likely, feeding sites. For example, grain spills um, or, or um, watering areas um, that deer need to go to to slake their thirst. Um, uh, the simulation, as it runs, builds up contamination in those areas 
and in turn, deer are infected from those areas. So this is an example where far from being the top ones up here, the top ones to this point are basically a fancy form of parameterization, right? It's, it's like we're using pre-specified information from the model to drive agents or to inform agents or to shape them. This, these top ones are basically GIS information is being used exogenously to influence agents, endogenous behavior. By contrast, this one, the GIS context becomes endogenous. Like we're dropping prions in the environment or dropping you know, uh, elements of, um, of uh, pro e-cigarette uh, marketing or, or, or uh, and so on on social media. Um, or something. We, we actually have, uh, or on you know, uh, promotional materials or what have you. So we're actually augmenting GIS data with model generated data. And that can be very useful. Think about pathogens surviving on surfaces in a, in a long term care facility, an aged care home, or a, or a hospital, you know, where my coughing um, may spread droplets which live on the surface for up to a few hours. And you may come into contact with that in a later patient encounter. Um, so the point is, there's, uh, there's models which very fruitfully take GIS data and use it um, as, uh, as context to store information generated by the model. And that's a, a bi-directional use of GIS um, context that's particularly powerful. And finally, um, there's many, there's some cases we've run where the simulation model produces data that we compare to what we see geographically. Um, uh, we compare it to patterns we do have. Maybe it's um, uh, indicators of um, characteristics of mobility patterns. And we, in the model, posit rules for agents governing their toings and froings. Um, and we collect statistics on that. And we compare it to comparable statistics from the world by agents carrying smartphones that record their location using Ethica. Um, and, um, and then we compare the two. And we say, you know, how well has the model replicated this decision-making feature of the agent or whatever when it comes to their, their mobility patterns. So this is another way in which the GIS data can be used together with modeling in, um, in terms of uh, sharpening our model. It's a, it's a different form of data used to, as it were, calibrate the model um, or test the model. So those are uh, a couple of ways. This, um, this model that you've seen here uh, only shows um, those where it's parameterized. But I'd highlight additionally um, uh, this other model, for example, as one that has additional features. I want to highlight a built-in any logic model, which whilst not geographic, it does have space, and it may be of interest. So it's this under example models, it's called wandering elephants, OK? I think Paul's familiar with this. Um, the wandering elephant model, OK? Now, the wandering elephant model is one of the more venerable any logic models. I think it's been around since um, uh, the earliest days of any logic. But Basically, it involves elephants wandering over a landscape, which is distinguished by elevation and availability of water, which they need to, to support themselves, and vegetation. Um, and um, <laughs> there's two types of elephants at any one time, endogenously determined. There's a happy and free <laughs> elephant, as well as a thirsty elephant, who by implication is not a happy camper, I guess. And um, the elephants um, here are, are actually engaged in um, water seeking, but they are further engaged in, um, in food seeking. And if we, uh, this is an altitude view, but if we move over to a vegetation view, you'll actually find the elephants interacting with the vegetation in a way that affects the vegetation. Now, this isn't clear from its current speed, where the elephants are seen to browse in a very, uh, in a way that seems epiphenomenal to the environment. 
But if you speed up this model, what you will see is sobering. Okay, so if, if, you, if you speed it up at full tilt, as I, as I can through this, you'll see it, um, oh, okay. Um, you'll see over time, the elephants are doing what? Can anyone see to the environment? What's happening to the environment? <laughs> that, that happens to the environment. Um, okay, um, um, enough said. Um, what's happening to the environment? The environment is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's being, uh, if not denuded by the environments, it's, uh, by the elephants, it's being, um, it's being adversely affected by them in some regions. So there are certain high altitude regions um, not well, met, uh, not well um, uh, visited by the elephants. Actually, the elephants don't care about the high altitude, but they're, they've got to slake their thirst periodically. So they need to head back to the lake margins uh, or to this, these watering holes. And uh, as a result, they tend not to go as far in the interior and in some reason, you know, further from these points. And so they haven't made it up to some of these regions. But the elephants here are engaged in a process of um, landscape modification uh, associated with, um, you know, partaking of that environment. And that's one of these cases where, as I said, the simulation model augments, in this case, it's not true GIS data, but it's, uh, it's, geographically inspired. It's, I don't think this is right now depicting a, a known place in Thailand or in Kenya um, for various types of elephants. But it is, um, it's inspired by that and it helps communicate the, um, the sort of ways in which uh, uh, they can be affected by the environment. So I'm going to start that again just uh, so people can see that because it was a bit marred by computational dysfunction. This is it at the beginning. Here's the vegetation. You notice the lush, verdant valleys and, and, um, and, and regions at higher altitude here. This is the altitude and this is the vegetation. And now if I run this model, slowly um, you, you, you will see only slow elephant movement. But you notice even now they sort of carve out these bits of vegetation as the tuskers browse the dense underbrush, okay? Um, but uh, if, you, if you run it faster, then you will see the, the process of, of, of attrition in the, um, um, in the underlying vegetation, okay? And uh, this is a model that illustrates that So, um, are an important area of growth for, for um, use of agent-based modeling. Any logic makes GIS interfacing. Um, uh, some elements of it are, 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 are greatly simplified by recent changes in the past few years with any logic, but it does have its, have its limitations. Okay? Um, okay, so I think I'll stop there for